So now to what I'm sure will be a lively and topical panel session. Do we get the headlines we deserve? And in this session, uh, taking us up to coffee, four prominent journalists give their view on our sector, how they cover it, <coughs> what makes a good story, what's missing, and importantly, what they think of our big news story today. So let me quickly introduce the panel. Chris Blackhurst is editor of The Independent, group editorial director for The Independent and The Evening Standard. Welcome, Chris. Claire Beale was until December the 18th uh, editor of Campaign. Now she's the brand new brand editor of Marketing Magazine, where in her first leader uh, this Tuesday, she talked about the pressures of proof and the need for us to demonstrate very actively the marketing contribution. So you're very welcome, Claire. Dan Saber is Head of Media and Technology here at The Guardian. Thank you for having us and sponsoring us and joining the panel. And finally, Mark Kleinman is City Editor for Sky News. And I'm an old enough media lovey to remember him as a very loyal and pushy reporter on Marketing Magazine many years ago. So I'm going to invite each of you to give a really quick 60-second view on our business, a view from the top on how you cover it resource-wise um, and your overall view on our business. And then we'll take a more leisurely set of questions for each of you. And then we'll turn the tables and get the audience to grill you for a change. So before we start, a quick show of hands. Who in the audience is happy, broadly, with the headlines the ad industry gets? <coughs> One person. <laughs> God bless you. And who in the audience feels we deserve more and better? OK, so that's your clear starter for 10. So each of you then, starting with Chris and then moving around, could you summarise for us how you see <laughs> and cover the business? Of course. First. Um, I sort of feel as though I've got the short straw. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I find that very odd, actually, that, that, that response. I mean, as, as the editor of The Independent, I mean, I'm, I'm completely obsessed with advertising. Um, I think advertising, um, how you get your message across, which is actually what we do in journalism as well, but what you do with, with profit on the end of it. Um, I'm obsessed by it. I'm obsessed by the way consumers behave and operate. Um, I'm always sitting in our morning news conference trying to spot the stories that um, are to do with the high street, to do with marketing, to do with consumer spending, all those things. Um, and so I'm really puzzled. We don't set out, I certainly don't set out to be critical of the industry. I think there are issues where there has been exploitation and things like that and I think we're rightly critical in the press but from our side from my, certainly my side of the fence I think we're very fair I think that's a grossly unfair response just sorry. now sorry sorry Chris but you're very welcome put that right today Claire um, when I started out many many years ago writing about advertising I remember this marketing veteran kindly marketing veteran taking me aside and probably patting me on the knee and saying, Market, uh, advertising isn't an industry, dear, it's a discipline. But actually, I think today, advertising has never been more of a, a serious business, taken seriously by the media. It's helped by people like Martin Sorrell getting out there and being seen as a very credible um, blue-chip business spokesperson. And advertising, I think, is seen as a more useful um, canary in the, the mine shaft of the economy. So it's taken more seriously as an industry, as a, a serious business. Um, and obviously the industry itself has become much more rigorous and developed tools and, and data to, to be a more effective um, business tool. I think perhaps we've lost something along the way somewhere. I think sometimes uh, creativity isn't allowed to take centre stage and, and the way advertising is portrayed in the media has lost some of the, the sort of positioning as a vibrant, sexy, creative industry. And I, I think we're perhaps poorer for that. Mm. Um, at Haymarket, obviously, we have 20-odd journalists dedicated to writing about advertising, marketing, media. It's fewer than they used to be, um, but we're all very clear that our job is to champion and support those industries, um, to celebrate best practice and to hold up a mirror to bad practice. Mm. Um, and we know the industry really close up. 
we know all the frustrations and the compromises and the harsh economic pressures um, that are a fact of, of agency life and marketers' lives. But we also see all the commitment and the brilliance and the, the sort of sheer privilege that it is, I think, to work in these industries. And we're absolutely on the side of, um, of brilliant, exciting, effective advertising and marketing. And there's never been a more exciting time to be reporting on that. I do think it's incumbent on everybody in the audience to help us do our jobs and to make sure that our magazines and our brands have a healthy future. Yeah, well, we can talk about that in a moment on how we can help you. But I think what you're calling for is for us to be at once both more businesslike <coughs> and more creative and sexy, sexy too. And the two aren't mutually exclusive. Dan, how do you see and report on our business? Uh, uh, look, I think <laughs> the way I see it at The Guardian, there are two stories in advertising. There are only two, and your, your challenge is to overcome them. The first story is Sir Martin Sorrell. He's the only person we want to write about. If he, if he, if he wakes up and walks, we want to write about that. If he's doing <laughs> a deal, we want to write about that. If he's talking about baths, U-shapes, Ws, Vs, I don't care what the letter is, we want to write about that. We don't, want to write, we don't want to write about anybody else, not because we're disinterested, but because there's nobody with such interest, with such personality, with such force. So that's your first problem. And your second problem is the only other thing we want to write about, the only other thing we want to write about is negative ASA rulings. And my God, we want to write about those because they're provided in a handy diet, whatever it is, monthly on press releases, thank you very much. And they give us a ready source of stories. And, you know, we're in the newspaper business. You know, we're in the storytelling business, we're in the drama business. We're, frankly, also in the entertainment business. Entertainment based around facts, admittedly, but nevertheless in the entertainment business. So if you want to interest us, you've got to tell us some other stories. Okay. And I'm astonished by how, in many media, just to the last point, in many creative and media industries, not just this one, I have the same issue with people in music and elsewhere, we, we, you don't tell us your best stories. I don't know where the personalities are, unless they're called Sir Martin Sorrell, I think I made that point. <laughs> I don't know where the personalities are. I don't know where the great, I don't know where the brio or the Alain is. I don't know where the sort of, you know, I don't know where the excitement is. I don't know where the controversy is. And until I know those kind of things, or I don't know where the success is. I don't know who's making a lot of money or doing, doing something fantastic. Uh, until I know those things, you're going to struggle to get an audience in our pages. Fantastic overview. So we've got to get beyond. We've got to get beyond Martin Sorrell and Guy Parker, I think he was saying, or the ASA. Mark, how do you see and report on our business? Um, well, uh, uh, 10 years ago when I was that pushy reporter, um, uh, certainly uh, a lot more rigorously and comprehensively than I do now. And I think that goes back to some of the issues that Dan's just raised, because uh, as the city editor of Sky News, I cover the whole sort of business waterfront. And um, unfortunately, I spend 90% of my time reporting on errant bankers. Um, I wish it wasn't the case, but it is. And I think Dan's right that there has to be a much more um, robust uh, engagement between the advertising industry and people who are doing my job, not just in the broadcasting world, but also on national papers, because I think the advertising industry is pretty invisible, actually, to most financial journalists. Um, I'm fortunate because my background was on the trade press covering uh, the industry for several years. But most financial journalists would not recognize three uh, names in the UK advertising industry. And it's a sad fact because of its contribution to the economy, but it is a, yeah. but it is a fact. And you, know, you asked about the outlook for the business this year. I mean, I think that I'm very pessimistic about the UK economy. I think it's going to bump along the bottom for much longer than just 2013. And because of that, uh, I think the industry is in for a, a tough time as well. Yeah. So it's important that we're showing the value of our industry to a tough Absolutely. economy uh, today. Thanks, Mark. I mean, I think there's some similar themes building that are very, very useful to us in the audience to hear. Um, so just going into a bit more depth, could we go back to you, Chris, and talk about whether British business, echoing some of the points Mark's just made, whether British business really values advertising and get your views there? Um, I think it does. I think, I mean, I meet a lot of chairman CEOs who, possibly a few from the old school, who still regard advertising probably the same way they regard journalism and a similar sort of sort of beneath the table. And um, I think, to echo what Dan said, I mean, I think advertising doesn't help itself. I mean, I think, you know, 
It's a mind-boggling array of initials that keep changing all the time with moody shots of three guys wearing open neck white shirts in campaign <laughs> saying they're going to transform. This is going to be the best shop, the best boutique. And I read that and I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then a year later, they've all broken up and then there's more moody shots of them standing on fire escape. <laughs> um, standing there saying, now we're going to do this, do that. And it's certainly true that um, <laughs> um, from a journalistic perspective, and I think to answer, try and answer the question, from the chairman, from the business perspective, um, I am puzzled why this industry, which has 100 billion towards GDP, it's so lacking in heavyweights, um, uh, heavyweight high profile people. I mean, I know a lot of had people behind the scenes, but you know, if you did a poll of, of actually you did a poll of a lot of business people, um, they'd probably only mention Charlie Saatchi, Morris Saatchi, Martin Sorrell, um, Tim Delaney, a few more, you, you know, um, and actually they start running out. And I think what happens is that, um, um, What's also happening, though, is that people are forgetting that there's been this big switch where, um, from this is me wearing my industry hat, is that um, uh, whenever I meet these people, they're obsessing about Twitter and Facebook. And what I'd like um, is them to realise that print and TV and poster advertising um, are far, far more effective. There's a, a big chase to, to a price going on out there. People are seeking very low cost advertising. It's not effective. Um, I'll give you a very good example and I'll stop, but this is why we believe in advertising. And I want you all to spend tons and tons of money in the Independent and the Evening Standard and I um, <laughs> and our online sites as well. But you know, I'll give you an example. We launched I two years ago. And if you listen to some of the chairman, chief executives, and they're all banging on about Twitter and Facebook and social media, and you wonder why, and it's because some guys turned up with a PowerPoint and then they think, oh yeah, my kids are into that, I better get into it. Um, <laughs> if, if, we'd left, if we'd left I, um, which we launched two years ago, if we'd stuck with I, it went to 50,000 pretty soon. Pretty quickly it got to 50,000. Um, we could have left it there and we could have just gone down the Twitter, Facebook, word of mouth route. By now, two years later, it would probably be at 65,000, if it was lucky. Um, what we did was, we had three bursts of TV advertising, old-fashioned TV advertising, spend money on TV. What did we get? Two years later, the circulation is five times mm. that 50,000. And what I say to people in this room, and people... They're not here. They're, they're, you know, the chairman, the, the CEOs, the FTSE 100, and those companies, the big spenders, um, stop, stop obsessing about Twitter and Facebook and come back to old-fashioned advertising. Very good. And that, you see, is a way of getting business to value advertising yeah. more. Great. OK, Claire. Chris touched on a tax on advertising there. Do you think a tax on advertising are inevitable? Um... I think, of course, attacks on advertising are inevitable. The absolute point of advertising is to be noticed and to start conversations and build relationships. And it's part of the culture of our lives. So it's up there as a, um, a very easy target for politicians and pressure groups um, looking for a whipping boy uh, for what they consider to be some of society's ills. Mm. Um, you know, advertising makes us too fat, advertising makes us too thin, advertising makes us go out on a Saturday night and down 12 pints and throw up in the street. Um, it's, it's a ridiculous um, chain of connections, but it's a very easy one to make. Um, because advertising talks to pretty much every aspect of our lives, it's inevitably going to be out there um, at the, on the front line of these attacks. Um, and I think advertising probably gets, uh, comes under more fire than, than broadcasters or, or publishers or Hollywood. Um, and the, it's seen as a, the sort of cynical commercial um, positioning that it's put under uh, makes it absolutely ripe um, for all of this mouth frothing um, that we get subjected to. Um, but we know all of this. Uh, we know we, we are uh, easy prey. Um, 
when going back to what we were talking about earlier, the Deloitte report and, and that sort of underlining the value of advertising to the economy, to consumer choice, to a, a richer creative landscape, to the provision of free media, all of these things, I think we're still failing to get that message across. I do think, prob my, my gut feel is that attacks on advertising have probably diminish diminished a little bit during the recession and we've all had much more important things to talk about. But I do think the industry has failed to take advantage of that, um, that let, let off and, and has failed to push home the message of value at a time when that's what we are all obsessing about. And we have to weave the message of value into the absolute fabric of what the industry is and does and stop just knee-jerking every time we come under attack and wheeling out another big report and another um, sort of lobbying initiative and just make it a fundamental part of how we do our business. Yeah, very wise. I mean, I think that role of protecting and promoting the value of advertising and pushing it up the business agenda is what you've, you've both been talking about. Thanks, Claire. So, Dan, turning to you, have new forms of advertising emerged that match and exploit best practice in editorial content delivery? Do you think the challenge we've got is more creative, technological, a sales challenge... Does the whole explosion of editorial content opportunity make our task easier or more difficult, do you think? The, the short answer to that question is no. Um, uh, and, and, you know, and, and it's a right, I'll struggle. It, it's nice to hear Chris talk about the virtues of print, and I can understand why, and the, eye, and the eye is indeed a success. So I don't want to sound miserable from that perspective. But, if we, but just thinking about it from the Guardian's point of view for a moment, we find it, you know wretchedly difficult, uh, uh, if not impossible, to sort of create kind of new uh, uh, digital propositions uh, that are attractive advertised in enough volume that might stop us from, uh, 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 that might help us make some profit one day in the future. And um, I think that's the best way to say that. Uh, 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 you know, and, and, and it's remarkable, and it, it, for us it's, it's astonishingly frustrating. So we have whatever we are, we're the eighth biggest daily newspaper in the UK. Uh, by print, uh, uh, but in the world we're the you know, second, third biggest online, and yet our print advertising revenues are three times our digital mm -hmm. ones. Uh, you know, we got, I think, four and a half million uniques uh, uh, visited the website yesterday, and we'll have whatever we'll have, you know, bought the, bought the newspaper yesterday. Uh, so there's quite a, so the sort of disparity, when I say whatever, will be about 200,000, by the way, to give a number, uh, 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 just to give you neither disparity, because you ought to see the sort of difference in, in quantum, if you will. And we can have a long discussion about the value of a digital eyeball versus a print eyeball, and we can go on and be happy about that, and you can tell me how wrong I am. But the essential point is that, that when you have a powerful global sort of, you know, on the one hand, we have sort of this huge global digital newspaper, this powerful brand, and then we've got this you know, massive opportunity, if you like, for Fleet Street to become, if you will, the Hollywood of newspapers, that is to say, to gradually export journalistic talent and ability around the world. We're trying to do that, and we're hardly alone. Look at our friends at the Mail Online as they advance into mm -hmm. India and America with all sorts of you know, nonsense on the sidebar of shame. Uh, so <laughs> we want to work... We, we, you'd be surprised how much we want to work with you. It's sort of, you know, imaginative imaginative partnerships, and you'd be surprised how difficult it is, although, my God, you'll sponsor some really dull bit of dreary editorial that will sit on the back end of our website that, you know, no one will read. We'll tell you it's red. You'll, I don't know what you believe, but you'll pretend that it's red, and we'll all go nowhere, whereas, actually, we'd like you to sort of work with us in the core business of propagating news and what goes around news, because that's, that's the, the thing that we deliver to the world, thank you very much, and, and we'd like to work with you on that. And yet... It's very difficult. We, you know, you run. You know, we still see it in the world, and maybe this is the Guardian failing. But luckily, I'm not the commercial side, and I can just see one of our commercial guys back there. So, <laughs> Mr. just Mr. Pencil knows that this is. I'm not criticising him, but we'll give you. We'll do a 45 second video, and we'll still. We'll, we'll, we'll do our own 45 second video, and then the best we can come up with is 30 second pre roll beforehand. By which time, any self-respecting sort of surfer has given up, gone to the BBC, where, where, where they can live without adverts. So I don't know why we don't have new forms that deliver attractive revenue around that. You know, you've seen things like, I know advertising overlay at YouTube doesn't seem to have worked as well as it might, and yet I feel instinctively that might be a smarter way to go. Uh, 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 there have got to be sort of smarter kind of partnerships that we can do, but we seem to be stuck in a very sort of traditional model where... Uh, uh, it's sort of, it's just about working for us, but God alone knows if it's working for you. Okay, so we've got to be much more proactive of 
stepping forward with ideas and working with you to develop well, I think new we're formats. More open, and also, we're more open-minded than you think, um, uh, which is not to say that the editorial's for sale, because it ain't. Uh, uh, but it is to say that, that if there are creative ways of working together uh, in which you'll support our work and our reach and our volume, then we're up for that. Great. OK. Mark, finally then, is advertising's link to business performance clear? You talked earlier about spending... 90% of your time on the, in the financial sector and on banking. So how do we get advertising's link to business performance clear as an industry and really as a country to stimulate more advertising and marketing investment and get the uh, virtuous circle effect that, that Gavin talked about earlier? I think the answer to the first part of your question is no, it's not clear. I think that when I was a, when I was a reporter sort of harking back to my days at Haymarket, um, the kind of most common complaint, I think, from marketing directors in sort of off-the-record conversations was that, you know, they might be working for successful businesses uh, and they may be playing their role in the, uh, delivering that success. But there was often a, a, a lack of a sense of advocacy for marketing in the boardroom. And that's understandable given that most CEOs, uh, even of consumer-facing companies, don't come from a... Uh, sort of marketing, marketing creative background. background. They tend to come from uh, financial uh, backgrounds. Um, so I think that that's one of the issues. And I kind of answer this now as an outsider pretty much 10 years on because I'm on the other side of this. But I wouldn't think that much has changed. It doesn't feel like much has changed. And ploughing through, you know, endless, you know, uh, corporate results announcements, you know, even for big consumer-facing companies, there's very, usually very little said about... Uh, the impact of advertising, the impact of marketing. Actually, it was refreshing to hear Carolyn talking about, you know, uh, lauding her marketing director for the role that he's played in EasyJet's success because it doesn't happen yeah. often enough. And I think, you know, the wider qu issue now is that today's report that we're here to talk about is can only be a helpful uh, milestone in transforming the terms of the debate um, because it's certainly the clearest... Uh, exposition I've seen yep. uh, as a business journalist of the role that advertising plays in the wider economy, the contribution it makes. And I think that at a time when the government is talking endlessly about the need to rebalance the economy uh, away from financial services, um, it's absolutely key uh, and it's absolutely clear that this is the moment that an industry like the advertising business should be seizing to articulate its case. Um, in terms of how uh, investment in the business should be stimulated, well, I mean, Gavin said that the industry isn't looking for handouts, which is pretty fortunate because there's no money. So, um, but the, the key thing I think for government to do is to, you know, it's not just for advertising, but more broadly is to remove regulatory barriers. Uh, it's to make sure that finance is getting through to small businesses, and particularly small businesses that want to export. Uh, that's absolutely crucial. Um, and I think that there needs to be a more uh, effective dialogue between government and this industry, and I know that that is coming together. I know you've got the Secretary of State here today, but this isn't just a message for the Department for Culture, Media and Sport. No, this no, is a message that needs to be heard in the Treasury yeah. and in the Department for Business. Yeah, thank you. So I think... Lots that we can do today, hopefully the start of that, of being running a more business-like conversation with the media, within business. And I think you rightly say uh, big business recognising publicly at those key moments like results time, the value of the advertising contribution, plus everything that the other panellists have been saying about more personalities, more news, more initiative, more promotion, less protection... Um, without forgetting traditional media. So now it's your time and your turn to uh, grill them. Again, we've got the roving mics. We've got 10 minutes for questions. This is your moment to ask questions and to show how we can help these guys uh, deliver what we're looking for. So questions, please. Yes, on the front row. Second row. Hi, uh, Greg Grimm here. One very simple question. Will you give the Deloitte report the due prominence it deserves in your various organs today and tomorrow? Good question. Chris? 
Yeah, um, I had a conversation with Gideon Spania, well, an email conversation last night, and we're covering it. And, um, it will be competing with other stories, but it will, it will be covered, yeah. It's done, it's in today. Yeah. Claire? Um, I mean, it's, it's part of what we do week in, week out, so it's great ammunition for us to drop into um, every way that we slice and dice this business. We, it's not a one-off this week thing for us, it's a, a long-term resource. Yeah, and there's a lot in the report that will endure beyond today, lots of good meaty info. Dan? We'll give it the coverage it deserves. I don't know what to say, really. I mean, I mean, you know, I, I've got the very brilliant Mark Sweeney. you will look at it and tell me what he, what, he, what he thinks it's worth. Mark's here, I think, somewhere. It's a slightly, I mean, this is slightly invidious on my part, because I was head of media until Friday, and I'm going to be... <laughs> and I'm going to be national news editor in about, three, about two or three weeks, and I'm actually between things. So uh, you're, uh, you're talking to a man who has no power to do anything. Oh, you but will. But it will get the coverage it deserves. You will, in your new role as well as your current role. Mm. Where is Mark Sweeney? Are you here, Mark? Can't see. No. Mark? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We will be covering it today. We're a very fortunate, very quick sales pitch for business coverage at Sky News. We, we have ring-fenced coverage every hour during the trading day, uh, and so uh, we'll definitely be covering it in that. And then we're very fortunate because... We have a business, a dedicated business show four nights a week for an hour, uh, and it's something that, uh, from my most recent discussion before I came here, we're planning to cover on Jeff Randall's show tonight. There you go, Tim, you're booked. Any other questions? Yes, Mark again in the middle. Mark Howe um, from Google and YouTube. Uh, I. I thought Mark put it very well that uh, it's a moment to seize the opportunity. And Dan asked, talked about uh, moving from the printed copy to the online copy and, and newsprint. And, and yes, uh, the skippable ads on YouTube, uh, Dan, have a 10x uh, a multiplier engagement. So that is an opportunity for you guys. Um, but I was actually embarrassed when Chris talked and almost pleaded for, for money to return to the print. Um, <laughs> when the consumer... I mean, the consumer, it's, it's about what the consumer's doing. And the consumer has moved uh, their allegiances and their media consumption. Television, actually, is media consumption probably still out, outweighs uh, the amount of money that is spent on TV. And actually, TV's ad revenues, as a result, have retained pretty much their share of market for the last seven, eight years. Print has halved. And, and I think it's, we, we can't sit on the panel in an audience like this, for, uh, representing the Advertising Association, and talk about the past. We've got to think about what the present, what the consumer's doing today. The consumer's moved online, and Dan's quite right. They've got to look at a way they can monetize um, their, online, their online business, not just uh, the, the print business. Yeah. Anyone want to comment? Yeah, on... we'd, like, we'd like your help. I mean, you're killing, Google's doing more to kill us than anyone else in its way. I mean, you don't mean to, but decouple it. But, you know, all that revenue, you know, you, know, you destroyed the classified business or taken it for yourselves, and look, that's life. Uh, uh, well, perhaps, and how much tax do you pay? But, but, um, <laughs> cheap job. Okay, take the We'd like to work, I mean, I, I, in all seriousness, I mean, I think, you know, we need to explore ways of working with you because, you know, no, I think the world, we absolutely, the world's changing, but the world's changing in a way that's sort of slightly, you know, going viciously against the likes of us. Mm. It's our problem, um, but we're very eager to work with people to try and solve it. Uh, yeah. Tess, and then someone at the back. I can't quite see who you are. Oh, hello, it's Rufus. So, Tess and then Rufus. Um, when I started at Thinkbox, I was very naive about journalism, really. Um, and I thought you'd all want to do stories about interesting new research that showed whatever it was. I've since realised that you need drama and you need storytelling, and we need to t give you those. But I am interested about how you deal with complexity. So, you know, Dan's just said something's going to kill him. Actually, you're not being killed by anything, you're actually expanding through online technology. You know, revenue might be tricky, but actually what we've got is a very complex media and advertising world. Um, you know, David described how Channel 4 is expanding on different platforms. So how do you combine the sort of journalistic need to have winners and losers and not really mislead readers and viewers um, into sort of thinking this is a winner, loser, somebody's going to die. It's all doom and gloom, because that's how it sometimes reads or comes across. Dan, do you want to take that first? Um, 
Well, we are feeling gloomy. Um, I mean, you're, you're listening. You, you, I mean, we absolutely take the point about. I mean, I think you're, the point that you made is very well made about the drama and so on. But we're feeling, you know, I mean, where we sit, we do feel we do feel a bit nervous. We do feel a bit gloomy. So I think that's sort of. I think it's hard for us to. You know, the challenge is for us to overcome that. I guess. Mark, anything to add? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I, I think that you know, it's a fact that you know, news journalists require news to cover stories. I mean, it's. Uh, you know, get involved in some more scandal, I suppose, is their message. <laughs> um, you know, and then I don't have to oh, talk to bankers for a, uh, for a few that. weeks. But, I mean, no, look, I'll tell you a point. The fact is, is that this today is a positive story. It deserves to be covered. And you would rightly take us to task if we ignored it simply, beca simply because it presents the industry and its contribution to the economy in a positive light. Uh, just very quickly, I'll tell you the kind of piece that I never read in Britain, and I wish I was clever enough to even write, and I'm not, which is, I think, ages ago, The New Yorker wrote a piece about the difference between Heinz ketchup and French's mustard, and why Heinz ketchup has been the number one brand in ketchup in America since forever, and French's mustard used to be, and has died of death. And mustard is a completely different category of product in which other brands, or was it Grey Poupon, is that American brand, has sort of, whatever it is, has sort of taken over. And that was a really interesting case study in marketing and food history and advertising. And I read it in New York about five years ago, seven years ago. I can still remember it. And I never read a piece like that in a British, you know, in British journalism yeah. at all. Truth about the sort product. of long history of brands and why there are winners and losers. OK, that's a brilliant tip. Uh, Chris Clare, anything to add on that question? Uh, I'm coming at it from a slightly different perspective because obviously we're specialist press. We have the space to address the complexities of the industry and the challenges and, and we're not just out for a, a, a quick headline to grab a busy consumer reader. Um, I think I'd, I'd agree with, with, with Mark and Dan. I mean, we're basically... Um, we want to, we want entertaining, dramatic stories. Um, one thing that really, really does puzzle me is that every day I must get, I don't know, 100, 200 emails more. I mean, just hundreds and hundreds of emails across my screen every day. And you can times that by a lot more for the whole paper and the whole online, everything. And a lot of them are from, uh, from PR agencies. A lot of them are selling surveys. Um, a lot of them are mind-bogglingly boring, um, and they're dressed up in a way that's mind-bogglingly boring. And and what we'd like from you, um, or from the industry, and it's interesting what Dan said. I mean, you know, actually engage with us, give us some case studies. Actually say this is what we've done. This is how we helped this company grow. This is the inside story. We appointed. There was this fantastic whiz marketing director who's got the job. He or she did this, they did that, they did that. And this is how it's grown. And tell us the story. And actually on the business pages, we're always up for stories like that. What's disappointing is when you get this, as I say, just mind-numbingly boring surveys or, uh, and, and this latest trick that's been going on for a few years now of people finding the most trivial thing to dress up as a survey. And they often come out over Christmas or when it's sort of quiet news day, you'll get this thing coming across your screen from a PR telling you that 90% of taxi drivers wear boxer shorts or <laughs> something like that, and you stare at this fact on the screen. Um, and this is from the Boxer Short Trade Association. And, and, and I can't honestly tell you how much of that crap we get all day long. And I don't know if my colleagues would echo the same, but it is, and I, I always look at it, and I always think, some poor sod is paying for this. Yeah. And some poor sod from the Boxer Trade Association, Boxer Shorts Trade Association, being bamboozled by somebody in PR and marketing and said, hey, we can do a survey and we'll find out. And, and they're paying for it. And I just think it's an unbelievable waste of money, but, you know, it's, it's not my call. Tip. I mean, the great news is we've got the stories. You know, we're not short of stories. We've well, got. Well, give us them. Zillions of brilliant case <laughs> studies, IPA effectiveness awards, but telling the stories in a compelling way is the nature of our yeah, business. I mean, one thing I would like to say, actually, is that people always think that we're only interested in bad news. I mean, I did a breakfast thing yesterday where I was, somebody said, you know, why do you always, always, you know, all the papers are interested in bad news. We're not interested in bad news. Um, we're interested in news. We're interested in stories, real stories. Now, it might not make the front page, because that has, that has to be dramatic. 
I mean, look, you have to engage with people on the newsstand. That has to be dramatic. Um, but, you know, the idea that all, the only thing that motivates is bad news is not true. I mean, we're not sort of 100% cynical bastards who go to work thinking, right, we're going to turn these people... That is not how we work. What we want are stories. He wants some scandal as well. So he wants we'll, some we'll scandal. Know. I want okay. some scandal. Give us scandal. <laughs> <laughs> OK, last question in this session. Rufus, still got your question? Thank you. Is this working yet? Yeah. Uh, Rufus Odins from Newsworks. I mean, just uh, as a prelude, a point about the stories that are covered. I would agree with, with everybody what they said, but there is something else which used to be popular when I was writing about the industry on the Sunday Times, which is when someone produced a blockbusting creative piece of advertising. And there were things like the Manhattan ad and a lot of the government campaigns which were not to do with selling something but changing opinion. And I think if there was more work like that around or people talked about some of the work that was happening like that, that is also something that's worthy of coverage. But to return to the issue about print and some of the newer forms of advertising, I mean, we're called Newsworks, and we're called Newsworks for a reason, because news does work, and it's about the content. And I think that's a very important point when one's talking about things like Twitter and Google and what our news brands actually create, that what is not interesting, uh, what is interesting is interesting regardless of the platform, and it's not a new thing or an old thing, and it's an impo as important now as it ever is, but it is, as David Abraham said earlier, a much more complicated landscape. And I would like to ask the panel whether all of the changes that are taking place, does that mean that it's creating a different way that you think about your relationship with advertising and the way in which it's funded, and whether you feel that's something that's worthy of coverage or that you steer clear of it because it is just too close to home? Do you feel some responsibility for the commercial success of the organisations that you work in? OK, so two bits to your question then, if I've understood you, Rufus. One is the power of the blockbuster ad to create headlines, and secondly, the value of new opportunities and new media to drive content. Dan, you touched on this a bit earlier. Do you want to uh, take that Sure, part? just... Um uh, just on the first part, actually, I think that we're always interested in, this, in who is the Sven Ghali, uh, and particularly around political advertising is something, I mean, that will never be bored of that story, and that's why everyone's heard of the Saatchi, that's why everyone's heard of Saatchi and Saatchi in this country, because they're linked to Margaret Thatcher. Uh, and, uh, and we're always interested in those characters, where they, where they exist and where we can find them. I think, lastly, oddly, they don't seem to be in so many advertising Sven Ghalis, they seem to have come from... You know, if you're interested in Linton Crosby, or I mean, they've got different kinds of, you know, these people have got different kinds of backgrounds, or, 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 or Andy Coulson, or, or, or Craig Oliver, or whoever it might be. So uh, that's a story that will never, never bore us. Um, uh, if those people, you know, where those people exist. I saw, what was the other part of the question? I, 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 I swear to God, I got it. The, the power of the blockbuster to generate yeah. headlines, and then the power of content and new media to The question is. What interest yeah. do you have yeah. in covering your own industry? The, 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 uh, uh, the great joy of journalism is, is that we can be uh, slightly tone deaf to our commercial imperatives and just call it as it is, which is the most important thing that we do, and therefore fire missiles on our own uh, commercial department's efforts or strategies or whatever it might be. And that is the most important sort of task, ta task that we have. Uh, um, that said, uh, I, I think the other thing I would also say is, look, it depends on your business model a bit. And I think that Mark's, got, Mark's part of this machine, fantastic machine of Sky, there's a great business model, has got all these subscribers paying, and he doesn't need to carry an advert on, it, on, on, it, on his channel and, and do that. You know, we're moving into a world at The Guardian, uh, uh, just the reverse world, where we're compete, turning into sort of ITV and Channel 4, I see for it, and obviously David's here. We're, 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 we're moving to a much more, you know, world where advertising is much more important to us, and I think that has... That, that carries with it a different dynamic. And it means that we should think about editorial partnerships more creatively. Should we change our coverage? God forbid. OK, quick answers, Mark, Claire, Chris. Um, I guess that, I mean, in terms of your point, Rufus, about the, uh, the blockbuster ad, I mean, it's curious paradox, really, about the fact, uh, that, uh, uh, that, the fact that you produce, this industry produces a pro uh, something which is, you know, it's visual, it's creative, it's striking, often, uh, and yet it, it lacks visibility in the editorial coverage of uh, the financial media, including on 
uh, Sky News. I, I, I do think it's curious. I, I think that the, that is why there needs to be this more uh, effective dialogue between the industry and us. But as far as your point about the uh, commercial imperative and whether uh, I, as a financial journalist, I, as a business journalist, feel responsible for the commercial success of Sky News, uh, only in so far as hopefully our business coverage is attracting people to watch the channel. Uh, but there's a clear separation, obviously, between the editorial uh, content and the commercial content. We have no interaction at all. Quick answer, because we're... Yeah, I mean, I'd say uh, I don't think it's true about the lack of interest in blockbusters. I think the point is there just aren't the blockbusters. Um, I mean, we can all say, uh, you know, FC UK, Trevor Beattie... Um, balls bouncing down the road. We, I remember we wrote stories about that. I think it was Sony, wasn't it, or whatever it was. I mean, you know, if the, ad's, if the ad is a game changer and everyone's talking about it, this is one thing that drives us. Um, I mean, we have a morning news conference, as does Dan, as does Mark, every single morning and have one in the afternoon. And once we go through the list, what we actually get down to, we kick our heels back and say, what are people talking about? What are people actually talking about? And what we're trying to do all the time is represent the zeitgeist. And people do talk about advertising. They do say, did you see that ad for so-and-so? On the commercial side, we're open to offers. I mean, one thing that saddens me, I suppose, is, and I think Dan touched on this earlier, is just how old-fashioned some of the proposals are. That, you know, can we do this feature that's buried in the business section that's going to be made to look like as close to editorial as possible. Um, and I'm saying, oh, hang on a minute, don't do that. It's so, such an old-fashioned way. I mean, come up with some ideas for us, come up with media partnerships and ideas, and we're open to offers. I mean, we're, we want our business to be successful. Brilliant. Quick answer, Claire. Um, I do think as an industry, we've become a little bit too obsessed with um, proving that we are, uh, we have an array of great business tools and have become less good at shouting about and celebrating brilliant creativity. And that actually is one thing that we can offer, the advertising industry can offer that the management consultants and the, um, all the other suppliers that clients work with can't offer. And we need to get back, I think, to celebrating creativity and encouraging media to recognize our blockbuster work. Um, I think as a journalist, the changes in technology have, have actually really enhanced what we do. We're all multimedia journalists, but we have to become much more aware of the commercial potential of what we're doing in some of these other spaces and therefore necessarily engage uh, with the commercial realities of publishing in a digital world in a way that we never used to. Great. Well, I want to say on behalf of us all a really huge thank you to Chris, Claire, Mark and Dan for a really fantastic, useful, thought-provoking and challenging panel session. Uh, so thank you all very, very much.